Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I think I'm the only one between, uh, between all of you and lunch, and we are already a little bit late, so I'm going to try to, uh, to do this quickly. These are some pictures of the museum of yesterday evening, the, uh, the Institute Pasteur Museum. How many, actually, of the people here went to the museum? Maybe raise some. There you go. I think quite about 50%. Um, for me, it was the first experience being in a museum with a glass of beer in my hand. I mean, never done that before. I'm showing you the pictures of the museum, actually, because there's a relationship with Sanofi Pasteur. And the Pasteur is not only in the name of Institute Pasteur. It's also a little bit in the ancient techniques you see there. We have the same heritage of very, very old products, which were developed in a completely different era. And some of these products we basically still make according to the same principles and sometimes even the same techniques. And that's actually where we are. And, uh, and in the eyes of health professionals, these vaccines have become commodities and we choose about price. I'm talking here about vaccines like measles, mumps, rubella, oral polio vaccine, yellow fever. And uh, yesterday I spoke with the director of uh, Green Signal, that was M.V. Zyre and heart name, and, and he told me he was just uh, with his family, he went and had his, uh, his vaccination for yellow fever. And, and well, this is actually how we made yellow fever in the 60s. Nothing very much has changed. Of course, we're not doing this on tables like this anymore, but the principle of how we make yellow fever is still the same. This is a very small market with very, very low margins and there's not really an incentive to completely redevelop this yellow fever vaccine. So we're basically stuck there with this production methods and this yellow fever, which does not really make us money, but we have a responsibility to the world to keep on making this yellow fever vaccine. So people like you who travel basically can have their vaccinations. Um, <clears throat> So this, actually, that's the part I want to go to, is these kind of vaccines, and they need, of course, their innovation, and we have to keep them up to date to 2013. That's why the need to improve existing vaccines with innovation. I need to say for my colleagues from development, of course, we have a pipeline with very high state-of-the-art new vaccines coming in, and we have some vaccines already, state-of-the-art vaccines on the market, but I want to focus here on those old vaccines, and as asked, I will give uh, some examples and even a little case study, and it will all be around influenza. I need always to show this slide. I can't help it. It just says that whatever I'm going to say right now might persuade you to either buy or sell your Sanofi shares. Don't blame me. Don't blame Sanofi. It's your own idea. So there we go. Big companies, they are, they are sluggish, they're there for stability uh, for different reasons, like they have to deliver according to plan, it all has to be stable, it's all about execution, short-term thinking, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Innovation, on the other hand, as I just explained, which we need, we need to keep on improving these products, is about experiments, flexibility, long-term, and taking risks. Nothing wrong with taking risks, sometimes taking a risk can be efficient. I mean, if you ever miss the plane, it's a saying that if you never ever miss the plane, you spend too much time on the airport. Right, so being more efficient, maybe take some risks. Um, so on the one hand, we have the industry who said, don't fix it if it ain't broke. On the other hand, we have the developers who are saying, well, we need to develop, we need to innovate, and we have these cool new technologies. And they always want to improve and make things better. Uh, there's a nice saying about that one in French, which is this one, and uh, that's le mieux est l'ennemi du bien. Well, there's another letter type in there normally, but okay. Which basically says that, you know, if you want to make things best, it's not necessarily ne needed, and it's basically that drive of making things the best is, an, is, uh, is dangerous for things that are already good. Of course, we need to improve, but best is the Japanese who say, no best, only better. So it's the best and the striving for the best and the not improving, which is dangerous. We need to improve, but that's it. So in the whole world of improvement, and there was, the, um, there was Watson Watt 
Second World War, he was, um, he was making um, radars against the, uh, the Luftwaffe. And he had this saying of imperfection. He said, just give me the third best. As the second best will always come late, and the first and the best will never arrive at all. So in that whole idea of innovation and sluggish thinking, and it is feel it's turbulent. There is the, the the commoditization, the globalization. Things go faster and faster and faster. We try to bring in innovations through digital revolutions. We're working on I don't know what Google glasses to walk through your lab and to see on your eye the pH of your bioreactor. We use as a we so well, without just with a wave of an arm you can swap through your pages of your SOP. Etc. We're bringing in these kind of technologies, but in the end, we need to improve the product itself because that's what it's about. And we do this with three different horizons. First horizon is the horizon of, uh, we, yeah, horizon one, so that's middle of a shorter term also. It's existing technologies which we already use in house, but we just improve them. This is about cost reduction. I will give an example of each of these horizons. Another horizon will be existing technology which is already out there but we don't use in-house yet. And in the end, there's a completely new, breaking new technology, which basically even gives you a complete new product. I'll give you a little influenza examples of each of them. So the first one, what we basically did, we did not change anything about the process itself, but we went to our Normandy site, where we make flu on eggs. Hundreds of thousands of eggs every day, seven days a week, non-stop pushing these carts, these trolleys through the facility with eggs. And we use a simulation program to see how these trolleys go through our facility, how these racks with these trays with these eggs go through the facility, how the people move, how they come in, get inoculated, get incubated, get harvested, and then get washed and put back into the line. And actually very cool to see these things moving. You see all the cars moving in a simulation. And like that, we could optimize how we do this in production. We did not really change the production process, but we saved cost. In terms of maintenance, we can now model and simulate how the maintenance is going to happen. We can pre-model and think about how to handle a malfunctioning piece of equipment and how we then handle the eggs in the meantime while we're fixing the equipment, etc., etc. Change over strains. In the second horizon, now that's existing technology we brought in for flu, that's 2D barcoding. That's against anti-counterfeiting. You have to make sure that when you buy a Sanofi Pasteur product, it is a Sanofi Pasteur product. We use 2D barcodes, RFID chips, holograms, etc., 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 to make sure these products are what they are. It also helps the nurse. Until now, she had to peel off this little label of the vial to put it in the patient's record. Now she just digitally scans it straight into the digital dossier. There you go. <coughs> Same time, the doctor can keep up its stock. As he sees everything coming in, he checks it's a real Sanofi product, and it's taken off his stock. It just helps at every level. Also at the vendors, etc. This we, done, we did for flu as well. And then on the third horizon, uh, then we talk about real new products. That's where we went from in, uh, intramuscular to intradermal. New product, uh, long, thick needle. We moved to a very thin, tiny needle. So it's not the scary needle. It's less of, a, of, of an invasion to the body. And the needle basically also retracts, so you can't have needle accidents. Uh, this went on the market in the United States a couple of years ago. And uh, so these are new technologies bringing in to, to innovate. I'm going to bring you a little case study on uh, the virus count we've been working on for the past couple of years. Um, there you go, we'll see it in bigger side. I think we started the collaboration with Cathy Rowland in, I think, 2006 or 2007. Uh, you see a little Endeavor logo on the machine. Back then it was produced by Endeavor, and uh, she developed that machine. And, um, and it counts viruses, basically. We worked with her with one of her first prototypes. We had one of the first machines bought and, uh, and still there in Toronto. By now, it's, uh, it's all done through a more commercial company called Virusite, but it's still the same principle. And uh, that, that principle, basically on that slide, I also put the names of Jonathan Haynes and Agnès Arribouillet of our Swiftwater site in Pennsylvania who basically did this work. I'm just presenting it. 
So the applause will be for, for them. Uh, how, this, how this works, there's not really a pointer on this thing, right? Oh, yeah, this one. So over there, over there, we, we basically color the sample with two different dyes, the fluorescent dyes, one against the protein outer part of the virus, one against the nucleic acid inside the virus. And we incubate for 30 minutes and then just push it into the machine. It goes through the little channel and detectors pick up every protein that passes by or every nucleic acid that passes by. If they pass by at the same time over a certain threshold, we consider this as a virus. Just in a nutshell. Uh, you see some results. Colors are not very nice, but believe me, this peak is red and it shows proteins. This peak is blue, it shows, it shows nucleic acid passing by. And if they pass by at the same time, these, these peaks, we consider them that those are virus-like particles. They're not necessarily intact virus particles, they're not necessarily infective virus particles, but those are virus particles. And we don't always need to know the amount of infective particles because it's not always a live vaccine. Sometimes we just need the amount of virus particles, which is more interesting than the amount of than a TCID50 or EID50. So, well, there you go. We're using this machine by now at multiple sites. This is like the little histogram of all the, uh, all the families of viruses. And by now we have tested it on uh, quite a large number of, uh, of viruses uh, within Sanofi Pasteur and within the Sanofi group, also within Mirial and Vax Design in Florida. So we had quite a, a large number we tested. And I'm going to go with you into only the, uh, the influenza one to show you our results with the virus counter. The commercial part, <laughs> there we go. Of course, we make a, a flu vaccine. We're one of the biggest producers of flu vaccine. Doing this for over 60 years, hundreds of millions of doses. <laughs> I've been producing in total uh, up to uh, two and a half billion doses. And recent innovations are the uh, ID I just showed and uh, high dose and we're now working on the quadrivalent. Meanwhile, other innovations have increased production up to 40% in 10 years' time, uh, just by base of innovations like the routing of the cards, etc. All little innovations everywhere. The driver for us for the virus counter were two different things. One is the optimization of the seeds. Every year, the new reassortants come in, and we have to quickly optimize these seeds. We used to base this on estimations of HA, HAUs, etc. But actually what we would like to have is just particle count. And in the upstream part, where we have the allantoic fluid, same thing, we would do optimization, we'd like to do optimization, but we don't have the necessary assays. So we were trying out the virus counter for this. In terms of the seed development, we were used of using an HPLC peak area count that basically gives a an estimation of uh, what we think is the amount of HA could be the amount of HA, and like this we could separate one strain from another strain and optimize. The problem with the HPLC is due to the enormous background of the proteins, the results of the HPLC in allantoic fluid is very, very questionable. Here you see quite, for this sample, quite a nice linear correlation between this HPLC and the virus counter. And this virus counter does this in one hour, and we don't need anything of tuning or problems with the proteins on the HPLC column. So now we have a particle counter, and, and that's basically the next slide. What, what we do in the first part of our virus production, of our purification, is we don't purify the HA, we purify the viruses. In this allantoic fluid, there's loads and loads of free HA which gives us in the beginning an enormous amount of HA, and we think we have quite some product. But in our purification process, by design, we only take out the virus particles and lose all the free HA by design. So measuring HA in the early part of the process is just not interesting. It just does not give us any information. What we need to know is HA on the virus particles. So this is where the virus particle comes in, because it basically counts particles, the ones we are going to purify on our... On our, on our zonal system. So, basically going from quantitative HPLC to the virus side counter for yield assessments. And here you see a little graph, some results. On the left is, the, is a very, very highly purified 
stock of whole viruses be used as a standard. Sample of atlantic fluid straight out of production, which we then spiked with the virus stock, and then we did it three times. And two out of these three basically give more than 85% recovery, uh, with an intermediate precision of uh, less than 15%. Those, accept those results are very acceptable for us to use in upstream optimization. So this is the kind of work we do with the virus counter. Gave us also the reason that now other sites are starting to use the virus counter as well. Just bought one in Normandy. Here you see a result of the virus counter result on the, on the screen. There is software. This is actually a sample we run in, uh, in, in April. Red line is the proteins, <coughs> giving two very nice peak over the threshold. Blue line is the nucleic acid, giving two peaks over the threshold. So those must be, if you zoom in on the long scale of the sample, those are two virus particles we counted. And the machine gives straight virus particles per ml, straight out of the box. Now, you, some quantitation with standard curves, depending on certain process steps, we can basically use this machine to directly measure HA in micrograms per ml using the curves. That just depends on which part of the process. And thus we have quick access to this kind of uh, data. There you go. Um, and so, in a nutshell, uh, different kinds of innovations we're doing within Sanofi Pasteur for the heritage products. Um, different levels of uh, Horizon 1 to Horizon 3, new products, and different technologies bringing them in. And all that is, and then just to remind you the one slide where it's kind of hard to put innovation into a facility, as these innovators want to take their risk, they want to miss their plane. And uh, of course the production side just wants to think about efficiency. What we do with our team in Lyon, we try to push from both ends, and it will look like this. We try to squeeze that wall away by showing the production end, and as we are in the production, we're throwing from the production end, we try to show that these innovations really aid, and they do give higher sales, they do give stability, and they give better forecast of our stocks. And uh, though there you go, that's what we do in innovation at Sanofi Pasteur. And we're back, uh, back in the museum. Thank you very much.